Hey everyone, my name is Andrew, pastor here at Sanctuary Church. Great to be with you. Uh, before we jump in, uh, I just wanted to encourage you again, as Jocelyn just mentioned, on November 3rd, uh, on election night, we want to encourage you to come and be here with us or uh, be online with us as we broadcast that. We're going to have this night of worship as folks are likely nervous, are worried, um, stressed, watching uh, results, listening to pundits. Um, at this point where there's nothing more that we can control or do, why not come and pray for our country, worship the Lord? Um, and I just think it's going to be a really special time in space. So there'll be these prayer blocks throughout the day where you can join us on the hour uh, during the time the um, the polls are open, uh, and then come and join us here at 7 as we worship together. Um, I'm, this is this message today is part two. So if you missed last week, I encourage you to go back and uh, and listen to it. I kind of asked the question: If all we had was the Bible, how would we make sense of political engagement as followers of Jesus? And so I try to lay a th basic theological groundwork in thirty minutes uh, of what it looks like for us to engage. Um, and so today, I, this is sort of a part two to that. And I want to drill down a bit and talk about um, how we then take um, this primary allegiance that we have to Jesus and how do we make sense of living that out here in the United States in 2020. So uh, I'm going to start by way of a story. At the end of college, uh, some of you know this already, I joined a campaign team uh, of an older friend, a mentor of mine who was running for Congress. And due to some very unexpected events, I found myself the director of the earned media campaign. That meant writing press releases, doing basically anything I could to get TV and other media to talk about Matt. So through months of sleepless nights and bus rides, uh, please ask me about some of the stories from those late nights. It was just a wild experience. I got to see the complexity around uh, what it looks like for a Christian to engage the American political world. Watching a deeply moral man with so much integrity who loved Jesus and wanted to help his country, watching him bump into all sorts of complexity, all sorts of issues surrounding what gets done and how it gets done in Washington and how to think about how to demonstrate and announce the way of Jesus in an environment that at times could be very toxic. It was a wild couple months that left me wondering, how am I supposed to engage this is this pivotal moment in my life where I'm beginning to think, like, could, do I have a career in this? How, um, how am I supposed to think about voting? That story I told you from last week about my history teacher, like that conversation picked up a whole new, um, there's a whole new lens and a whole new world to explore, a new speed after working on this campaign. So today I want to start, if you have your Bibles, Philippians 1.27. And if you don't, if you've never opened the Bible before, if you're brand new to the way of Jesus and any of this, um, you'll see the verse come up on the screen uh, and also there in the chat if you're watching on our platform. Philippians 1.27. Now we spent a fair amount of time in Philippians last Sunday. And we were talking about how Paul uses all of this political language. You are citizens of heaven. You are, uh, you're, you are uh, a, talking to the church, supposed to be this outpost of heaven uh, in Rome. And so we see the same language actually happening right at the beginning of the letter. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, this uh, word conduct yourselves, you're going to see it written right here across my chest. What, uh, what pops out to you when you see that word? All right, this word is derived from the, the root word polis, meaning city or state. This is where we get the term politics. The verb form of this word simply means, which is what Paul's using here, is living as an active citizen of the polis, of the state. So a person's responsibilities as a citizen of Rome were, quote, to quote a scholar, regarded as the most important thing in life in which the free citizen gave their total allegiance. 
So when we look at this verse in the context of the whole letter of everything that we talked about last week, Paul is clearly saying, fulfill your responsibility as a citizen of heaven by living a worthy life, living as an active citizen of heaven, living in a manner worthy of that citizenship. This is the question, right? If being a Christian means that our entire lives, if you, <laughs> if, if you agree with everything we talked about, if being a Christian means that our entire lives are now reoriented by Jesus, our allegiance has been pledged, our vote has been cast, then we have to, according to this verse, be good citizens of our home country, heaven, in the United States. You ever been overseas and you see like a, 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 a fellow uh, American acting foolish and you just want to scream, like, knock it off. And then you want to turn, of course, to everybody else who's watching whatever scene might be unfolding and say, like, look, we are all like that. I promise. I don't know about you, but I don't like being hated for the wrong things. If you're going to be hated or accused of something, I'd like to be accused of something and hated for all of the right things. Peter, actually, in his letter relating to this, he says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong. Now, actually, let me stop there. Though they accuse you of doing wrong, there's a lot of really solid speculation about what that accusation was. The short of it is, is he's writing this letter to a church that is under uh, the rule and reign of Nero who it is well documented that Nero is not a fan of this Christian movement. And there's all sorts of reasons and horror stories, some speculative, some we have some solid information on. It's the dark time. And so it's, uh, there's a lot of stories about these fires that swept through Rome uh, about 60 or 70 years or so, A.D., when this letter's written, and that Nero starts blaming actually these widespread fires on the Christians. Peter's not just um, offering up some general like platitude. He's like, look, look, though they accuse you of doing wrong, though they may, that make sure you live in such a way as foreigners and exiles, he said, remember, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. So now what comes next is, is interesting. And we don't really have adequate time today to go through a more thorough uh, teaching on the role of government. But Peter gives us a glimpse, just like Paul does, if you're familiar with the Bible in Romans 13, of how we are to see earthly governments in contrast to our heavenly citizenship. Again, if I've lost you, this is just where we are at, talking about how do we engage, conduct ourselves as heavenly citizens in our Nation. So apparently as foreigners and exiles, we're supposed to see ourselves, Peter says, live such good lives, even if you're being accused of things, still love such good lives. And then it goes on, verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and command those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves or bond servants. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the empire. There's a lot there. Show respect and honor, but your allegiance isn't there. Government has a role to play, in this case, keeping the peace. And even though you, he's writing to this church, aren't really free, live like you are. Use that freedom that you actually have because you're citizens of a place where you are free. Use that freedom in a godly, Christ-like way. So we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of Jesus by living good lives, by loving sacrificially, by turning the other cheek, by honoring authority where we can. And we can't, right, always. 
It, it, when we look at a passage like this, or again, if you know Romans 13, which is often talked about in political seasons, Paul says almost the same thing. It is my opinion, as well as Yoder's and Harawas and Gonzalez's, that we are to obey government, not because we have a duty to it, but because we have a duty to God. And he tells us to submit to government insofar as it's possible. Because government is simply not worth bucking up against if we don't have to. Because this will distract us from doing our Christian duty of embodying another world, embodying the kingdom, embodying and fleshing the way of Jesus. Look, when we look at the cross, we find out that God revealed through Jesus. He revealed to us that we, would rather, we should rather die in the name of love than kill in the name of freedom. This, I humbly submit to you, should shape our approach to all political engagement. Love. So as a reminder from last week, this, for centuries, Christians were jailed, even killed, for refusing to make imperial sacrifices and refusing to kill for flags and idols, insisting there's something worth dying for, not worth killing for. They refused to pledge allegiance to anything other than Jesus, but still live such good lives that often the government would open doors. Or if we go further back in the story of the scriptures, there's actually favor that men and women of God have with kings and pharaohs, and they were able to contribute to the thriving of the land that they lived in for folks who were God-honoring, following people, their tribe, and for every other tribe. So all of this is a nice segue, almost like I planned it, <laughs> to this next moment. If you were unaware, we live in a quasi-representative democracy. You and I have some input into our shared common life. This actually, at its roots, is what politics is all about. Our shared public life. So if we are conducting ourselves in the way of love and the way of patience and the way of self-control and the way of humility, right? The fruits of the spirit, the things that show if we're truly walking with God, what then? What about voting and protesting and policy writing? I want to submit to you that we should run all of this through the lens of love thy neighbor, we can engage in the political process, not out of fear or anger, but out of love of neighbor. We can vote and serve and participate, but we do this as exiles and we do this as sojourners, not as people who pin all of our hopes on a party and politician. I know you all know this now at this point, but this matters. Our starting point matters. To run this through the lens of, the love, of loving of our neighbor, we can see then how government can actually be used. Now, followers of Jesus have thought very differently about how we should actually do this. There's a lot of reading to do. Stanley Harawas once famously argued basically, go ahead and vote. Just don't expect much. And you have, I, I, I don't even know if I want to say on the other hand, but you have as a bit of contrast, you have Martin Luther King Jr. saying, look, I, I know it's true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me. Maybe one way to think about political engagement would be uh, through the lens or the idea of damage control. We can produce less damage. We can minimize damage is one way that we can love our neighbor through utilizing the tools that are, uh, that are at our disposal in politics. Maybe uh, you can harness the principalities and powers for some good who will do the least amount of damage in the world and alleviate the most suffering for the most people? What system will provide like better freedom? What policies will help people thrive freely? These are the sorts of questions I think we need to ask. As a Christian, as a citizen of heaven, I'm learning about what matters to God. This is why we come to church, one of the reasons. This is why we, we, we 
join together in home churches. This is why we wrestle with the scriptures. What matters to you, God? We know that's where the truth is and the life is and the love is. And so we want to come into alignment with that. So God, talk to us about health care and disparities between the rich and the poor and about schools and about the death penalty and about abortion and about systemic racism and about gun violence and about militarism. We will always have a hard time voting for a particular candidate. So maybe we, we can consider, like consider what it means to vote for our neighbor's lives, to vote for the poor, to vote for the immigrant, to vote for those without health care, to vote for those who are incarcerated, to vote for the victims of violence. Rebecca McLaughlin um, wrote recently, uh, Christians shouldn't not care about poverty because other folks care about poverty, whoever that is, whoever you in your mind view as sort of the enemy. Christians shouldn't not care about racism because secular of, you know, folks care about racism. Christians shouldn't not care about human life from womb to war to tomb because other folks don't. She writes, we should dance to our Savior's music no matter who is playing. But here's the thing. We vote every day with our feet and with our hands and with our lips and with our wallets. We need to think of the faces behind the scenes. Who are the masters and of the Caesars that we pledge allegiance to by the way that we live and through the things that we put our trust in? There are school boards to join. There are outposts, missions in our church to start. We have a bunch of money and resources we'd like to give to you. Because boiling down political engagement to a vote is insufficient. It is an incredibly impoverished vision of God's call to love your neighbor. We can vote. We can't just vote. Leslie Newbegin once said, when the church tries to embody the rule of God in the forms of earthly power, it may achieve that power, but it is no longer a sign of the kingdom. Whew. We have to remember that our goal is not primarily to get our earthly nation, to get the United States to act more Christian, but to help the church be more Christ-like. That should keep us busy for quite a while. Peter says in that same letter, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. By the way, I think this is why many are frustrated with the tacit endorsement of our current president. It's not about him. It's about the uncritical support that so many people who claim to be followers of Jesus have given. We have to get our house in order. And you know why all this is important to remember? Because change is not confined to one day every four years. Now, I know you, I don't need me to tell you that, but it's important for us to remember this. Change happens every day. We vote with our lives. And social change historically doesn't come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up, just like water boils. The holy and political work of what Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. The holy work of seeking first the kingdom of God is not confined to a ballot box. It is the work of embodying the prayer, embodying, we keep using that term, putting flesh on the prayer on earth as it is in heaven, in providence as it is in heaven, in Newport as it is in heaven, in Rhode Island, in New England. Like we need to figure out what it looks like to embody this day in and day out. Loving your neighbor is a critical lens for us to see political engagement through because of how deeply political that phrase actually is. Michael uh, uh, Gerstner says, Jesus was executed as, in part, an enemy of the state. Contemporary leaders, political and religious, found his otherworldly kingdom threatening because it demanded obedience to an authority beyond their own. Jesus' followers were soon being executed for failing to show proper respect, that is, refusing to offer sacrifices to the Roman emperor. 
In the Roman world, Christians challenged the political status quo on any number of issues, including slavery, infanticide, and the status of women. Christianity may not have laid out a blueprint for an ideal government, but love your neighbor had social and political consequences. So, some closing thoughts for us on how then we should participate. And I just tried to factor in questions that I've been receiving over the last couple of weeks, conversations I've gotten into, to try to put a little flesh on this. And then I'm hoping to, we'll see how things go in the next week, talk a bit about then what does, how do we access our political imagination? So a couple of thoughts. Number one, um, we need to participate with eschatological hope. Now, eschatology is basically just the understanding of the Christian future, making sense of the end. It seeks an answer to where is history headed. Christians have to participate in this political system, in this political moment, by not being too heartbroken by it and not being too excited by it. Anyone need to hear that today? We shouldn't throw ourselves fully in. The scriptures say that of the increase of his government, there will be no end and his kingdom will reign forever and ever. So even though things may look bad to some and good to others, things will move on and Jesus's kingdom will increase around the world. So let's hold back some of our hopes. Let's hold back some of our hopes and expectations for the age to come and not vest them fully in any political moment. That's hard, because I think we want to cram all of history and eternity into one moment and one lifetime. This is not how things move. The church loses credibility and weeps for the wrong things when it over-invests in any political ideology. Prophetic distance is critical to the way of Jesus. And by that, I mean what we talked about again last week, not becoming enmeshed, being able to stand at a distance and witness, not stand at a distance and not get engaged with helping people who we need to help and serving and advocating, standing at a distance and owning that when we talk about we, we mean the followers of Jesus. We, we don't mean a particular party. Secondly, when we engage in a larger conversation as the church, we need to do this with humble conviction. I have another quote for you. Karl Barth says, the church exists to set up in the new world a new sign which is radically dissimilar to the world's own manner and which contradicts it in a way which is full of promise. I love this contradicting the way of the world, but doing it in such a way that we offer a vision, a hopeful vision of another world. The church must be a provocative countercultural community of alternative promise for the world. And when we do this, we should have a different manner and a different tone. A couple of things to consider about this. One, we should not be unnecessarily, and hear the word unnecessarily, abrasive. When you run everything through the lens of demonstrating, announcing the kingdom, all you see are opportunities for people to encounter Jesus. The idea of engaging in like a culture war, how that becomes ridiculous because it's self-defeating. You're trying to wage war with the very people that you want to love and you're supposed to serve and you're supposed to bear witness to. You, if we're living out our, our faith well, where other people see like attack, we just see possibilities. Number two, we should have some level of cultural sophistication about uh, the complexity and nuance of things. Number three, we should be theologically orthodox, rooted in Christian tradition, not making ourselves the authority in this moment. And number four, we should be in search of common ground where possible because we live in a post-Christian pluralistic society. It has been my experience that if you are not abrasive, culturally sophisticated, historically rooted Christian in search of common ground, you will surprise people. They may still disagree. They very much will still disagree with maybe much of you, you have to say, but you will surprise people. We can, with thoughtfulness and prophetic distance, participate, vote, protest, organize if the spirit leads. So number two, 
I don't even know what number we're on right now. You have to participate with personal integrity. I want to challenge you on two things with this. Personal integrity, stuff that people love to talk about. Morality and poverty. Morality and poverty. Everybody, everybody was in an outrage, rightfully so, when that hot mic was on Donald Trump, when that video came out before he was elected. The horrible things he said about grabbing women. Horrible moment. But if I asked you, like I asked, like if you were all sitting in this room, if I could talk to you right now, and I asked how many of you have looked at violent pornography objectifying women this past month, my guess is that the room might go a little bit silent. Because we love to condemn when the president does it. But when we personally do it, we excuse it. Why are we making personal excuses for things that we are publicly condemning? Right? This is hypocrisy. What about when it comes to money? We need to deconstruct global capitalistic regi regimes that are oppressing the world. And may I ask you, like, did you buy a boutique coffee drink this month or this morning? I'm talking anything above black coffee, like pour over single origin. And so what are you doing for the poor? Why aren't you voluntarily giving more of your taxes, more than are required? Like m my point, but that's not a knock on buying good coffee, by the way. <laughs> my point is that our life is our message and we have to embody this. You're going to get so tired of me saying that word, embody this as followers of Jesus. Okay, a couple more considerations. Prayer and intercession. We are called to pray for our leaders. Christians believe in sins of commission where we consciously choose to break the law of God. And we also believe in sins of omission where we have failed to do what God commanded us. You were commanded to pray for this nation. My guess is that some of us, and I'm putting myself on the chopping block here, need to repent where we have not taken up this call. You never know just how powerful your prayers can be. You never know how God can rush in. God can rush in in a moment, can break in. So if you have angst, if you have heartache, if you have a longing to see the world better, if you want to see God move, pray, intercede, fast. These are effective tools of engagement. Next thought. Can we be gracious in our conversations with people that we disagree with? I know I shouldn't have to say this, but nothing good has ever come from criticizing something or someone on social media. Just stop. Have a personal rule. I'm never going to debate somebody on Twitter. A friend of mine has this great phrase about social media, transcend the fury. <laughs> transcend the fury. All right, coming to the end here. Have a stronger vision of love. Christians believe in the power of love. The state can legislate and penalize, but only Jesus can make a person want to be different. Listen, I don't know how to tell you this, but you will never be able to guilt someone who is well off and wealthy to give their money to the poor. The ability of money to numb yourself and numb whatever guilt you have is extraordinary. There's nothing like a good massage to blot out the cries of the poor and the oppressed. <laughs> but Jesus, when he has a confrontation with Nicodemus in what is the like Jamestown Barrington of Jerusalem in Jericho, where all the wealthy had their second homes, when, Je when Jesus confronts him, the arch tax collector, the head of the system. Jesus puts a needle right at the heart of the financial exploitation and greed through what? Hospitality and love. Don't underestimate the power of love to change things. So we should pray and believe and model love and not rely purely on legislation, even though it can serve important purposes for our shared life together. Christian political engagement. Christian political engagement is distinct in the way our we have a refusal to be manipulated by fear that frees us to prioritize the needs of our vulnerable and hurting and lost neighbors over our own. So I close in almost the same way I think I closed last week with three words. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord has been the claim of Christians under every political framework you can imagine. Capitalism, communism, 
Christians have proclaimed Jesus is Lord. In freedom and under oppression, Christians have proclaimed that Jesus is Lord. In the underground church and in the institutional church, Christians have claimed that Jesus is Lord. At some point, this nation will fade away and this cultural moment will be looked back on and Christians will be judged And the thing that we want to be judged by is not our fidelity to a political system, not our fidelity to a political party or to any given candidate. We want to be judged on, did we declare in our time and in this place that Jesus was Lord of all, that he's worthy of our primary allegiance and he is worthy of our integrity, that he is worthy of us resisting the state where necessary and he is worthy of us building an alternative community of love in this place. And so my call to you family is a call to discipleship that your life with the authority that you've been given that as you live and as you move and as you interact that the world will become more and more and more like the kingdom of God and the rule and reign of Jesus like will just shine brighter than ever because you are joining God in the renewal of all things. We are here to serve and we are here to lay down our life. All right, Jesus says, don't don't be like the rulers and authorities that we see in the Gentile world, he says to his disciples. He says, whoever wants to be first, must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are here to serve. And so let me just close with this. The art of hating our neighbors right now is being taught by both the conservative and the progressive powers. They are involuntarily, or maybe very voluntarily, attempting to capture your most scarce resource, your attention. They want to take it hostage with the language of fear. So resist, resist, resist. Take hold of what is the most common command, the most often repeated command in the scriptures. Do not be afraid. It was John Newton who said, there is one political phrase, one political maxim that comforts me. The Lord reigns. I pray, I pray for peace, I pray for joy, I pray, Lord, for love. God, I pray this, Lord, for our inner worlds, I pray this, Lord, that it would mark our engagement Um, I pray, Lord, for the things that we pray for. (laughs) Um, Week in and week out, that we like declare week in and week out. God, that we would um, be known by love and that we would truly be a voice of hope for our world. Help us, help us in this new season of ministry. Help us as we head into a new year. Help us as we step into a new future with um, whatever happens in Washington. Help us, Lord, to be uh, to that voice of hope, to be clearer and stronger and more beautiful and more captivating than ever before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.